We all have memories of seeing our first real library, of encountering endless shelves of books and wondering how anyone could find what they might be looking for in such a large collection. How would you know if the library has anything in your area of interest anyway? Well, every book has a code. It might be a Library of Congress code, based on a classification system created in 1897. It might be a code from the Dewey Decimal System, created even earlier in the 19th century. We classify books on the basis of their content, and we use these classifications to find new information, to put books back in the correct place, and to assess a library's holdings. Classifications pervade our everyday life. Just like the Library of Congress, Amazon classifies its books to help us find publications we might be interested in, and, more important to Amazon, to bring our attention to books it thinks we might be persuaded to buy. All e-commerce sites categorize whatever it is they want us to buy. eBay has an online product catalog that is different from Amazon's. Craigslist organizes its content using an entirely different system. Each site on the web recognizes that its survival depends on how it categorizes its contents and how well the terms that it uses match the way consumers think about the products that are being offered. It's not much different in biomedicine. Biologists may not be trying to sell anything, but they often need to categorize the things they study and to group things together to clarify their common properties. We call this categorization an ontology. Ontologies are often visualized using an indented tree structure, as in a file browser. This ontology of amino acids, developed at the University of Manchester, tells us that alanine, along with asparagine, cysteine, and glycine, are some of the aliphatic amino acids. A biologist can examine this ontology to know what amino acids exist, what their properties are, and how one might classify them. An ontology may exist only as a conceptual scheme in our heads. We all categorize and classify the things in our world, but we seldom are explicit about writing down our classification systems. When we do write down our ontologies, they become available both to people and to computers. If we want to know what kind of amino acid alanine is, or if we want to write a book about alanine, or if we want to state that we performed an experiment to measure the concentration of alanine, then ontology can give us a set of standardized terms and relationships that can facilitate all of these things. Our ontology can tell us that aromatic amino acids are not aliphatic, and that amino acids have other properties, such as a standard genetic code. Biomedicine is simply replete with ontologies. Nearly 300 years ago, Carl Linnaeus proposed his binomial nomenclature for speciation. Linnaeus's hierarchical structure of categories of life forms, with each class of organism having a unique genus and species, was a seminal accomplishment. It's still with us today, and perhaps the best known scientific classification. In the 19th century, the precursor to what is now the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD, appeared on the scene. The ICD provides an ontology of diseases that the World Health Organization uses for international public health activities and that the United States uses for all medical billing. By the turn of the 21st century, a huge international effort was underway to develop an ontology to represent the properties of gene products, the biological processes to which they contribute, the specific molecular function that they perform, and the cellular component with which they are associated. The result was the gene ontology, perhaps the most widely used ontology in bioinformatics. The gene ontology is instrumental for interpreting many high-throughput experiments, and it provides a comprehensive, well-curated digital knowledge base of basic biology. So ontologies are everywhere in biomedicine, standardizing the way that we refer to basic biological processes, to human diseases, and to everything in between. The whole idea of ontology is credited to Aristotle, who formalized the notion of categorizing what exists in the world. Ontology became the branch of metaphysics concerned with the study of existence. In recent years, however, the study of ontology has leapt from the realm of philosophers to that of computer scientists, who create data structures to encode what entities exist in some application area, what the properties of those entities are, and how the entities relate to one another. 
The desire of biologists to use computers to catalog the results of gene expression is not far from that of the software engineers at Amazon who refine the company's product listings. We are all engaged in work to enumerate what exists in our respective domains to clarify and communicate properties and relations. We do this to create a description of what exists in some particular application area for the benefit of people who seek clarity regarding the structure of some human experience, for software agents that may need to process information about some application areas, and perhaps most important, for the interaction between people and computers, so that people can be explicit about what they mean, and so that computers can act on human input in the most precise manner possible. We create ontologies as standards, so that we can have agreed upon terms for describing the things that matter to us. There is no need to redefine speciation, for example, when Linnaeus already solved that problem. Having such standards allows interoperation. I can compare my data to your data if we call things by the same name. Computers can also reason about things reliably and efficiently when we use standardized terms and IDs to name things in the world. There's another side effect that occurs when we develop ontologies to describe the entities in an application area that matters to us. We solidify scientific communities when we all use the same language to refer to the same phenomena. Science advances when we can agree on what exactly we are studying and what we should call things. The HubMap project is a large undertaking supported by the United States National Institutes of Health that relies heavily on biomedical ontologies. The goal of HubMap is to create an atlas that can describe every type of cell in the human body and to describe the characteristics of cell types in terms of genomic, proteomic, and other biomarkers. HubMap needs to be precise in how its atlas talks about the anatomical location of cells. It needs to be precise in how its atlas talks about cell types and biomarkers. There is no other way to obtain the necessary precision than to use standardized ontologies. When scientists who are working on HubMap think about collecting data about an organ such as the kidney, they recognize that the anatomy of the kidney includes a set of substructures called calyces that are all wrapped in an outside layer called the renal cortex. Each of the calyces has constituent parts that are understood all the way down to the cellular level. The HubMap investigators are capturing information about the kidney and about many other organs in the body in a format that lays out the anatomical substructures, the constituent cell types, and for each cell type, the known biomarkers that identify cells of that type in the particular anatomical location. These tables for anatomic structures, cell types, and biomarkers are known as the ASCT plus B tables, and they depend heavily on ontologies. The anatomical structures need to be represented explicitly, as do the cell types and the biomarkers. The use of standard ontology terms for all the components of the ASCT plus B tables enables scientists to describe anatomical structures, cell types, and biomarkers with precision. People can search the tables using the ontology terms. The use of ontology terms allows them to be confident that they can access all of the relevant data and that they can evaluate all of the information that has been stored. The ASCT plus B tables represent anatomical structures using terms from an ontology for vertebrate anatomy known as the Uber Anatomy Ontology, or Uberon. How do you get to see what terms the Uberon Ontology provides? There are several repositories that store information about biomedical ontologies. The most comprehensive is a system known as BioPortal which has been supported by the NIH to provide access to all publicly available biomedical ontologies in the world, currently several hundred. We can use BioPortal to search for the Uberon ontology and see that Uberon consists of more than 20,000 classes or terms and that users view Uberon at the BioPortal site nearly 1,000 times every month. BioPortal can show us all the terms in Uberon in a tree browser. If we want to focus on what Uberon has to say about the kidney, we can search for that term and BioPortal will bring us there. We can see that Uberon has a term for the kidney and subclasses indicating the left kidney and the right kidney, as well as terms for the progenitors of the adult mammalian kidney that are seen at different stages of embryogenesis. Uberon makes distinctions about anatomy that are different from those made by another ontology of anatomy, the foundational model of anatomy, or the FMA. 
we can visit the FMA and BioPortal and see that it includes more than 104,000 terms. The FMA is also frequently viewed by BioPortal users. The FMA includes terms for the kidney, as well as the left kidney and the right kidney. The FMA models only adult morphology, so it doesn't list the terms for the embryonic kidney structures. In fact, when we compare the FMA with Uberon, we see some interesting differences. Uberon lists the embryonic structures, whereas the FMA does not. Uberon models the kidney as a kind of cavitated compound organ, whereas the FMA models the kidney as a kind of parenchymatous organ, which is a kind of solid organ. Which ontology is correct? Well, that depends on the assumptions that the ontology's developers have made, and whether those assumptions apply to a user's situation. We can't always tell by inspection what those assumptions may have been, and thus why ontologies can make different or even contradictory statements about the same entity. One ontology might model light as a wave, and another might model light as a particle. Every ontology developer has to make assumptions about the context in which an ontology will be used, and those assumptions often govern what an ontology will say about the world being modeled. Ontologies are thus models that, within a particular context, enable us to talk about the entities and relationships within an application area without ambiguity. But ontologies do not necessarily share the same perspective. One ontology may talk about the adrenal gland, and another may talk about the suprarenal gland, but they are really talking about the same thing. However, sometimes the kidney is represented as cavitated and sometimes as solid, and we have to accept that the context in which an ontology will be applied can affect how we characterize the entities that may be modeled. The major contribution offered by ontologies is that they standardize the way we talk about the world. The gene ontology provides standard terms for describing gene products and their behavior. Uberon and the FMA both standardize terms in anatomy, but they do so in slightly different ways. Both ontologies continue to evolve as we learn more about anatomy, and as the developers make new decisions regarding how to model anatomical structures. Biomedicine has hundreds of ontologies that describe different areas of interest. The availability of so many ontology resources offers a great benefit to biologists and clinicians, although the total number of ontologies can sometimes be overwhelming. Fortunately, resources such as BioPortal can help users to identify the ontologies that are most suitable for a particular task and applications such as HubMap's ASCT plus B tables can draw on these ontologies to standardize their terms, to ease access to complex information, and to help us all to speak the same language when we interact with these computer systems.